Planning board is now in session. Good evening. First item on the agenda is a uh, continued public hearing, Chestnut Meadow, zero Chestnut Hill Road, definitive subdivision. Continued from May 1st, May 15th, and June 5th. And at 7.05, which is right about now, Chestnut Meadow, zero Chestnut Hill Road, special permit for lower impact development. Continued from May 1st, May 15th, and June 5th. Good evening, George. Hold on, I gotta get a mic. Actually, uh, should Karina, should you tell us what's happened since we met last? Sure. In the interim, um, Cornerstone Engineering provided a new submission, revised submission, I should say, dated um, June 12th, um, which we forwarded to, and they also forwarded to Fuss and O'Neill. This evening, re we received review comments from Fuss and O'Neill um, late this afternoon. We forwarded them to George as well. Uh, there's also some, some additional uh, comments from the Open Space Preservation Commission. Um, so George is here to discuss those changes. Also submitted to Fuss and O'Neill were the um, potential changes to the roadway entrance. So they had a chance to take a quick peek. Okay. All right, George. Welcome so back. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, on six five, you had we had sent you a uh, little uh, email with some interesting uh, information regarding the intersection design, and it's blown up here a little bit. But we'll start with this drawing here, which was sent to you by email, um, and it shows a center island going in the first hundred feet of this particular project. A little bit of a bulb at the end. And that's in response to one of the uh, questions and comments that you had, Mr. Morris, to try and come up with a sketch for that. So this is not an official submission. It was for your information and to go through it. We also addressed the road lengths and some open space. Quickly on the open space, originally the site was going to be with um, uh, inter, um, individual wells. Uh, since that is not going to be the case, there's some room to move things around. So the open space is now 1.65 acres or 10.5%. Um, and then the water line has been added to this plan and Fuss and O'Neill, I think, missed that on their letter. It is in there and it's got a hydrant here and there. And of course, we all know that there's about 1,035 feet of connection out to Northborough Road. Um, in any event, this grass strip uh, is a little bit of an island and it provides a turning radius for cars to come in and then it uh, lines up going right down this street with a little bit of a curve. So it blocks the view to the greatest extent possible um, with the geometry and not changing a lot of the uh, plan. Although lot 12 would have to change a little bit to take some land out of it. It has enough land to do that. Um, the last part of this is that because there's going to be an island, we would have to work on the grading for each side of that pavement. It would be generally be super elevated, so it would be a catch basin on either side to pick stuff up and then transmit it out. So uh, it's not a final design plan, and of course we still have the discussion about the length of the road. Uh, we also looked at several different um, layouts, as I indicated in the email. We could curve this road in and then come back into it so it has a very steep curve going into it. M meets the radii, but then those tangent lengths are uh, a lot longer than 400 feet. And it really didn't look good, so we didn't uh, have that as a submission for consideration. Now, this is the landscape plan showing how that would be landscaped, heavily landscaped, and these are uh, dogwood type trees that go down it. Um, there's also the landscape plan for the entire subdivision, <coughs> which shows all the trees going down along it and the landscape for the existing subdivision as submitted. 
Um, if we put the island in, we'd make that change if we can all agree to it. And um, then this is a kind of a diagram of the street, uh, <coughs> the street curb appeal. There'd be sections of fence, then there'd be sections of uh, stone wall. You'd see the driveway coming out, sections of fence, sections of stone wall. So that would be the um, curb appeal going down the street. Um, and we'll be happy to send you that plan, although it's just a diagrammatic plan. Um, and then finally, <coughs> there was some discussion relative to the, uh, the basin. So the basin is right behind here. Here's the entrance to the street. And this is what the whole thing would look like, a lot of heavy trees, uh, evergreens and conifers to try and hide most of that basin. This would be about three feet high with the little sign on it. So um, that's the way that looks. Um, the other aspects are um, Fuss and O'Neill's letter. They had indicated that everything seems to be in order except for in the last page there's two references. One was to a sediment, um, to the spillway into the forebay. <coughs> so this spillway comes out and it dumps into the forebay, but that's where it's supposed to go. When the water comes out of the street drainage, it may have some particulate matter, and the forebay is designed to capture that before it goes into the detention basin, and then you can go in and easily scoop that out. Conservation's aware of that last um, Thursday night. They said, don't pay any attention to that because this is the way they want it, from my understanding from Vito. And then um, Fuss and O'Neill indicated that the water line isn't on the plan, but I think last time when I was in here, we went over the water line and the two hydrants, one in the middle of the road and one at the end. Um, so at that point, I would turn it over to you for questions, comments, or discussion on the uh, island, if you want. Thank you. Open it up to the planning board members. Uh, Mrs. Luttrell. Um, the disturbance in the riverfront area went from 8.4% on the previous plan and now it's 9.8% on the plans that we received. It may on have. That's a conservation issue, but it may have because of some of the grading around the basins. So if um, the addition of the uh, double barrel beginning of the street, will that increase that disturbance? No, but it will um, increase a little bit of the riverfront um, disturbance in the street, in the right of way. It still won't bring it up to the requirement, even if we allocate that, which is in the public right of way, to the subdivision. Okay. It's a very small amount. Um, and do we have a landscape plan? You do. Did, but did we get a copy of that? You did, and you got one stamp. That just isn't stamped. That's from our file. And that was part of the 612 plans? I believe it was. Okay. I, don't, I didn't see it in there. Do you know what page it is? Uh, I don't. Comment number six on Fuss and O'Neill's letter today, George, says uh, about a landscape plan will be submitted to the board, prepared by a landscape architect, and then the note is, will review once submitted. Does that help you at all? 
Yeah, I thought it was in the set. Maybe it wasn't, and it is up there. You can see her name, uh, Suzanne McDonough, RLA, and we did have a stamped copy. I just didn't bring the stamped copy out of the file when I made preparations for this meeting. Yeah, I don't have it in the set that I received. I, I can leave you that one and send the stamp one in the morning. Um, do we have wording for the open space easement? Not yet. Um, did we get, um, did town council opine on the length of the road? Uh, no, we were holding off on submitting a request for legal opinion until we see how it goes this evening with um, if it was favorable or not to move forward with the double barrel road entrance. I'd, I'd like his opinion just to know what that air, what his opinion is of that regulation because it's come into question in case we get another subdivision. Um, the the ten foot wide strips of open space, I'm still not in favor of. We've had issues with them consistently in the past and. When you know better, you do better, so I don't know why w we would accept them when we know we've had continual issues with them. Um, there, it shows um, bounds to be placed for uh, conservation in the, the no-touch, some of which are within the open space easement, so they're, it's gonna be disturbed to place bounds within the open space. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they, so the open space is a no disturb. Well, if you read the open space regulation and zoning, if that's what we're applying, it says any disturbed area shall be naturalized or some such language as that. Well, the subdivision regs say to remain in its natural state. Well, that may be true. Um, we don't argue that, but we do argue that 81U gives us the ability to put in one lot worth 10% of the area um, for a period of three years or 10% open space, which doesn't define uh, wetlands as being part of that. So I, I don't know where well to go with this wetland argument back and forth. If you ask for 10%, we gave you 10%. It's an as of right subdivision. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, you're just going to have to make a decision and, and tell us what you want in your vote. So the, the regulations on the open space, whether it's a parcel for three years or the 10% on each lot, is up to the planning board. The planning board may require. I don't agree with that. I think it's an option for us, but you can choose either one. Um. Can you tell me which um, lid techniques were integrated into the plans? Which lid techniques? Uh, Stormwater infiltration for the roofs, the sediment forebay, gas traps in the um, manholes, um, the infiltration in the basins themselves to recharge groundwater. So rain gardens, bioretention areas, permeable pavement, any of those? No, none of those. So none of the techniques that are mentioned in the, the bylaw, the special permit requirements that say they should be integrated into the plan? The uh, net result of the rain gardens and things of that nature, the permeable pavement, is to get water into the ground. And the detention basins are doing all that they're taking the entire area of impervious on this site and putting it back into the ground to equal groundwater flow, which is the same premise for uh, the lid designs. It has the pollution attenuation for 80% of the total suspended solids, and it puts all of the water back into the ground. Other lids will just be duplicative and not end up getting the water budget. And do the house locations, are those sh they shown on the plans? No. So don't our regulations 
ask for the proposed structures on the definitive plan i don't know that that's true we you were at you asked for the driveways we put those in we don't know what the houses are going to be we don't know how big they are we've allocated five bedrooms to each one of these house for a specific size in the stormwater calculations for impervious area but we don't know where the houses are going to be we have no idea this is a subdivision okay. for a road okay thank you mr. Stein so the means by which we've increased the open space on the plan to 10 percent a little over 10 percent is the elimination of the wells and the use of public water correct because of that the wells had certain radiuses certain protective distances between various structures on the site such as infiltration and septic systems so by eliminating those those didn't impact where other things went and allowed more land to be usable for open space so <clears throat> Uh, Karine, I, my concern is, you know, in the course of going forward with construction and work, at some point, the proponent may revert back to individual wells. And I'd be just be concerned from the perspective of, you know, how that would be addressed by the, the zoning enforcement officer and so forth. Well based on my experience level. Um, it's my understanding that if they change something to the site plans, such as going from wells to a water line or back to wells after an approval has been granted, that they would need to come back for modification to site plan. So have you had any discussions with the building inspector about that to about make sure about the change in the plan? That they're going to be using the Northboro water instead of individual wells. Uh, no, there was the plans were submitted to the um, building department for review, and they had no comment. We submitted all submission, you know, all revised submissions to the building department, um, and there were there were no comments. Um, generally, when we meet, we discuss the plans a little bit, but we never discussed in detail. Um, once the decision is granted with the conditions um, it would be my understanding that at this time before building permits are um, allowed that they contact the planning department and ask if conditions for the in the decisions w are met at which time I would review the conditions and then report back to him if we were all set or not I think that we would make a, a very clear unambiguous condition especially regarding this part of the the plan because mm -hmm. it does pertain to open space which is such a an important issue in the town of Southboro um, the fact that it's somehow linked to the water is noteworthy to me and should be is noteworthy okay I couldn't hear you noteworthy, no noteworthy yeah Okay, I'll make a note, make sure we get something in the conditions. So, um, sorry for um, going back to the landscape plan. I, I guess maybe I missed where we were with that because I think you had said you were, had submitted it. I thought we had, and apparently we have not. Okay, so that's still a question mark. Um, but so they don't have the landscape plans, but you did submit the rest of the plans to Fuss and O'Neill, and that's what they're... The, the base subdivision, which does not have the island, that's the only difference. The base subdivision... Well, but there's also the wells thing with the changing the water. Well, that, that was gone a long time ago. Okay. That was gone a long time ago. Two or three revisions, I think. Okay. Anyway. So the... Plans relative to landscaping are for the road without the island. Okay. So Fuss and O'Neill's already reviewed the, the, the portion of the plans pertaining to the water? No, they have not. Um, the plans that were submitted by Connor Stone on June 12th that were submitted to Fuss and O'Neill 
did have the public water supply they did. designed on there. However, there was a minor oversight, well, I don't want to belittle it, there was an oversight um, from Fuss and O'Neill. They didn't notice the water line was on there. I believe that in my email to them when I pointed out um, the additional information, like the double barrel entrance, they might have confused that I said the water line, the entrance way is changing in the next set instead of realizing the water line is on this plan. So we still need Fuss and O'Neill's review on the water, water the, and landscape the landscape plan, and the island. If the island, if that's, if the, if the island is the route we're taking, and the plans get updated to show that they have to review that as well. If the island is the route we're taking, mm -hmm. could you elaborate on that? Maybe I'm. Well, last time we were here, Mr. Morris asked for a schematic of how we could do something to. Uh, block the view. I'm You're leaving that up to this board? Well, um, he asked for some uh, a diagram or sketch or some such thing, and we sat down and came up with something. We're happy to add it in. Okay. I discussed it with two 20-foot lanes on each side. I indicated that it's not a design. It will work. We just simply have to grade that 100 feet so that we have drainage in the street. Um, it would be super elevated, so the center uh, adjacent to the islands would be higher than the curb on the uh, outsides, and then two catch basins would go in right. the street. That's for the sight line, now I remember. Okay. Yeah, so it, it works. We've made sure it works, but we didn't do drainage, we didn't do grading, and um, we didn't do pipe sizing or anything like that. So what, in that island, what's the height of the plantings? Are you going to put in like uh, there were, uh, dogwoods? They're going to have a clear understory from, uh, there's going to be some plants on the ground during the growing season, uh, up about a foot, foot and a half. And then from there to the dogwoods, there's going to be a clear space on the stem of the dogwood. And then there's going to be tree foliage from probably about seven feet up. So as you come down to look down the street, as you look, to enter traffic, you're going to be going west, but you're going to look to your left. You're going to be able to see up the street. And you can see quite a ways up that street. You can actually see through a couple of curves from that location. Where you are on the site, when you go out there today, the road is actually a little bit further north than that. So there's plenty of sight distance and safety at that location. Um. Are you going to be planting mature trees then in the there'll be, island? There'll be reasonably good trees. There'll be probably 10, 12 feet in height. Can you go through the, the, uh, the screening or what, what's going to be on the boundary then of, um, of, the, of the main road? I'm not sure I understand that. The abutting road there. Oh, here? Yeah, and, yeah, and down, yeah. In other words, on the southern boundary of the... So right adjacent to the street? Yeah. Um, and if you in heading that way. This no, way? The other way? West. Uh, West. East. Yeah, east. This way. No, heading in? Uh, heading uh, along the line of the of the, of the parcel. All right. Um, just tell me yeah. when my pen's the right way. Just what's going on here. Oh, nothing's going on there. We're just putting in a detention basin along this stretch behind uh, lots eight, nine, and ten. Um, this stays natural. Right in here, we have a bit of a grading. Uh, swale in behind the trees, and that comes down to this location here. Um, generally, no water is going to flow through there because we're putting it all in the ground, but it is the ultimate low point on the site. Well, what's there now on the line that I just... That's open field. If you look at these curved lines going along the edge, there's overstory and underbrush here. Um, dense, it's pucker brush, it's all sorts of invasive stuff on the MWRA or MDC land. Typically at the edge of a field you have all that dense 
herbaceous and uh, shrub layer that you can barely get through. So that's all adjacent to that lot line at the farm. Are, are you concerned about a lack of screening? To what? To the houses. Oh, no, there's, there's quite a lot of vegetation in that area. Okay. There's quite a lot between, well, even down by the wetlands. Okay. So we don't have any problems with... I don't think so. Okay. No, I, I, don't, I don't have the uh, color drawing, I think. Um, I bring the color drawing tonight. Last but not least, have you seen this letter from um, Frederica Gillespie? She's, uh, she wrote it as an individual, but it's, um, she's a member of the Open Space Commission. I think she had some interesting points. I, I received that. 25 minutes ago. Okay. I haven't read it yet. I would be curious to hear your feedback on that at the next meeting. Sure. All set, Mr. Stein? Mr. Jenks. Good evening. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Um, the driveway itself is what width? The driveway? The, the roadway is the what width? I believe it's 24 feet. It's 24 feet paved. Um, you have reviewed this with police? No. Uh, fire? No. Uh, DPW? No. <laughs> but you're going to, yes? Yes. The, the reason is because we originally had no water. Now there's water. Right. I'm not going to go back and talk to the fire chief and say, well, it might be this road, it might be the two ways. I'm going to wait till we decide where we're going and not confuse the poor man. Fair enough. Um, The, I'm wondering about snow removal and plowing and where is snow going to get pushed to? Is that up on each yard? Or? Yes, there's a snow um, storage easement going along the, dry, the roadway for that. I don't know that it'll actually get there, but the roadway right-of-way is 50 feet. The pavement's 24, so you get 13 feet from the edge of the pavement before you get to the lots. I know people use that, but it's technically yours. Okay. Um, is there any street lighting? No. No. Um, the length of the road is still an issue and your I, I guess I have a question for Mrs. Luttrell you you wanted to hear council's opinion on that the street length um yes and I'm confused about why or what you are expecting council to say about that well, there was a, um, Mr. Connors had a different interpretation of that regulation than I did. Um, his interpretation was that the road could be a thousand feet. My interpretation was that it was the frontage for 12 lots. And, and do you know what the frontage for the 12 lots comes out to? 900. Exactly. So it's well for the f for required frontage, yes. But these are more than the required, aren't they? Yeah. So that would that would be a thousand. There's feet. a couple of them that are significantly more. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering if it's going to be so close that it's insignificant. Well, moving forward, I'd just like to know what the regulation means. Thank you. 
Um, an issue not specifically related to this, but it seems that we're getting Fuss and O'Neill's letters about two hours before the meeting. Is there something we should change to, to <laughs> yes, there is. Um, so, so that we can get their review in time to read it? Is, yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of um, protocol they've been used to. Um, and I was wondering the same thing. Because um, in the interim, we do remind them to return comments as soon as possible. Um, in fact, we even require, you know, submissions to be about seven days, or I think seven days ahead of the actual meeting so that there's a chance for the board to review um, and also, you know, turn it around so, that, you know, the, so that the reviewer can turn around a, a decent review. So not just this meeting, but for several of them, they've been coming in, you know, right before the meeting. So I'll probably have to set up a uh, conversation with the project manager there to make sure, uh, to see if we can change that to give us some more time because it's causing, you know, even if everything was okay, we'd still have to have another meeting, so. Thank you. Um, I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Um, going back over those, I, I agree with Mrs. Luttrell as far as moving forward and relative to this on the length of the road. Um, Karina and I talked about that, but um, and, I'll, and the answer that she gave was that we, we decided to hold off on asking him that question uh, for, I guess, the following reasons. And this also goes to what each of you have, have talked about. Uh, you know, we haven't had that many subdivisions show up uh, recently, but at one time um, it was uh, just a steady line of uh, one right after the other all over town. And um, we've seen uh, subdivisions come in and the proponent has the project fully designed uh, and with, unless there's uh, some hard engineering revisions that are required, um, the proponent is inflexible and, w and only wants to build what has been designed, which on one hand makes it easy, you don't have to make a lot of changes, but on the other hand, the inflexibility um, doesn't uh, maybe capture some of the better ideas that the public, the neighbors, uh, and the planning board and other departments may have. And then we have other subdivisions like this, where the proponent comes in, actually we have others, have had others, where the proponent comes in, shows us a piece of land and says, what do you think? And uh, kind of putting the, uh, the lien on the planning board to design it, in which case the, the board would send them off and say, no, it's your project, it's your land, you design it, and then we comment on it. But in this case, this is um, uh, similar to that, but uh, the flexibility here that um, we're seeing is, I think, on the high side. Um, George has come in with this project. Um, he's listened to and made made changes, the wells to the to the water. Uh, there was a suggestion about the uh, you know the the street the streetscape at the entrance, and he's come in with these uh, concept changes. Um, and he's, you know, he's willing to uh, allow us to comment on it and s see how far that, that can go within their design. So I think it's our job tonight, uh, first of all, is to uh, do we want the original design, which has just the road coming out, or do we like the, uh, the island concept? Uh, and we should send George on his way with that answer tonight so that it's, he, can, he can proceed with some more uh, deeper engineering. The, the, um, uh, the town planner uh, sent an email dated uh, 
uh, June 12th, and it uh, put out some ideas, and, and the feedback from George was that uh, we would discuss those tonight, one of which is the width of the road. Uh, uh, this is a, a dead end, and uh, so it's, it's certainly not a through street. And a 24-foot wide road, in, in my opinion, uh, is, is excessive um, f for this type of a subdivision. The width of the road can be, I think, uh, much narrower, and um, I think we have examples of that around town. Uh, you gave some examples of lengths, mm -hmm. and I, I noticed on, um, <clears throat> I think it was one plan, or somewhere in this information that uh, across the tracks, we have uh, Barn Lane, I think that's 24 feet. We have Andrews Way, which is, I think, 20 feet. And they're similar roads. They're, they're, they're dead ends. Uh, and uh, so I, I just feel that uh, we have examples around town where the, the, the width of the road is, um, the width of the pavement is less. And that's, that sends a positive it, it, it's, le it's, it's less of a boulevard, it's more of a country road. Uh, it has a, a big impact on the uh, drainage. If you go from 24 feet to 20 feet, that's a 20% reduction in impervious. And if, if that reduces the uh, uh, stormwater uh, system requirements, then it may uh, increase uh, available land for open space. These lots are big, and the driveways would be, they wouldn't be short. So you'd say, well, okay, we need a wide road so we can park uh, neighbor, we can park visitors. But I guess, you know, with, with the size of the, these lots, uh, off-street parking is, shouldn't be a problem. We shouldn't rely on the width of the road to park. So um, I would suggest, I would encourage, I would be in favor of narrowing the road as long as the police and fire uh, went along with it and then see how that it would reduce your your uh, costs it would reduce your uh, uh, stormwater design and uh, put less of an impact on on the neighborhood on the new neighborhood um, I'll give you a chance to comment on these things if you yeah, want that's fine. George I'll be happy to. Uh, the, the the name of the road I think is very appropriate but right around the corner we have Johnson Road I don't pick names. You can tell me what you want. Uh, I, I think it's very appropriate, but sometimes, uh, you know, we had a, a, we had a time when uh, every road was something meadow or meadow something, and the fire department uh, expressed concern that there were too many meadows, mm -hmm. meadow roads, so because uh, it, it, it leads to confusion in an emergency. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with this if the fire and the police don't, um, using the, the, the having two streets in the same neighborhood that start with Johnson. Where, where is the other Johnson? I don't recall. It's, um, yeah, it's off of, off of uh, North Pro Road. It is? Yeah. Okay, I don't remember. Okay, no, that's, I'm just curious. Yeah. 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 Yeah, whatever. Well, we're not calling you for an emergency. <laughs> I'm not on the fire department. <laughs> so that's that's one thing that uh, yeah. either it would give you for homework or we'd have, have the town planner uh, check with public safety to see if they're okay with that name. Yeah, the, the names of the street I, makes no difference to me. I, I think it's appropriate, but... Uh, and maybe those concerns were back when there was just, like, telephones, but now everything's on the computer, so... That's true, too. Yeah. Um, now, the reason, uh, this goes back to the length of the road, um, I, I felt that, uh, I think it's, Phil, you were beginning to talk about it, is that if there's sufficient, uh, enhancements or concessions or, um, you know, improvements that aren't required, but that you, you make part of the subdivision, then, and it's your desire to, to have that extra length, we may not agree, we may not agree that, that you're entitled to it, 
and therefore it would be a, uh, a, a request for a, a revision, a, a, a waiver. And uh, again, depending on how the whole picture plays out, then the board in the past and could in this case waive what we think is the rule mm -hmm. and allow this, this distance. And uh, you know, things like additional open space, things like uh, uh, the, uh, you know, maybe the reduction on the, uh, on the pavement, things like uh, additional trees or other things that not just the planning board but the, the other departments may uh, ask for uh, all plays into decisions relative to waivers. And it's, again, it's where I started off with was that, you know, some developers will come in and they're rigid and they don't want to talk. They just want to follow the rules or ask for the waivers and move on. It's all designed, take it or leave it. But your, your approach has been uh, the opposite. You've, you've come, you've, you've been willing to, to make revisions and, uh, and try to make it a, be a better subdivision. So I guess I'll, go, I'll, I'll let you respond to the width of the road. I, I know you want to get out, leave here tonight with a decision on the, uh, the entranceway. Um, in terms of your roadway width, Mass Highway has adopted very low volume roadway standards for roads that are very familiar to people, such as subdivision roads. You're not driving down a road that's not familiar to you uh, for the most part. So radii and slope and side slopes and forward sight distance and dimensions of the road pavement are much less than the typical standard regulations that most planning boards have. The only caveat is that under NFPA, the fire department wants 18 feet and 22 foot clear. And that's to put out those outriggers or whatever the snorkel or whatever they have. Um, and that's all easily done in the site. It's just deciding where you plant the trees. They might have to be back a little bit further or not. I don't think in this situation that's the case. Um, the entranceway, if it is a island, then it would have two 20-foot pavements. I think that's the standard in your regulations. Um, so someplace from the end of 100, probably 50 feet, you transition from that down to 20 feet, if that's the case. Um, in terms of, there was a discussion about a center island. I don't care whether it's a center island or not. I know DPW doesn't like them, but that's not my issue. Um, in terms of uh, the landscaping, I think the landscape plan is, is very good. She used to be a planner, a landscape planner for the town of uh, Weston for quite a while. And I've used her on a lot of jobs and she and I have the same sort of idea for these um, more um, rural and farm type applications for this type of uh, landscaping. I think that basin is hidden, that basin on lot one is well hidden by that. Um, in terms of what's on the other side of the road, you might want to formalize it with something um, such as some uh, fir trees or something like that to balance it. Um, but that's about all I can say about landscaping on that particular site. Happy to go to 20 feet. The stormwater works for all the impervious that we have in there. We wouldn't want to change the stormwater calcs, just agree that because everything can happen, it's fine, except that if we do the island, we'd have to have your review or your Fuss and O'Neill review our piping and our grading on that first 100 feet of road. Um, I'm happy to talk about some other stuff too, but I really, I, I, I think it really hinges on the island. So let's ask the board, Mr. Je Mr. Jenks, your opinion. I like the island. I think that's a good addition and it uh, serves as a block on the view straight straight into the, the uh, subdivision. <coughs> um, I'm in favor of it. Mr. Stein. 
Um, I, would, I agree with Mr. Jenks's comment. Uh, the, the visuals are extremely important on this project, so I, I'd be in favor of the island. Mrs. Latrell. Um, I like the island also. If the pavement goes down to 20 feet to kind of make up for the fact that it's 20 feet on each side at the island, and then if it's narrower, I think that... It would narrow helpful. back to 20 over 50 feet or 60 feet. There, there'll be some geometry in the highway book to get that, but it will be by 150 or 200 feet, it'll be back to 20. I think it was, I, I might have brought this up at the last meeting. I think it was Buffalo Run. Uh, it's, a, it's a dead end. Uh, and I think the pavement there is 18 feet. And what we did was the, um, the builder uh, stabilized the shoulders no pavement, but they were structural, mm -hmm. sta stabilized f for, for what you were saying, that the fire trucks, if they went off the pavement, they wouldn't get stuck in the mud or uh, the plows and so on. But uh, the pavement width was narrower and the edges were stable. But that was more of a, a bit more primitive than, uh, of a design than, than uh, what you have here. This is very, uh, like, contemporary. Yeah. Yeah. I do have... Uh, I'll just say a uh, comment on the, you know, I know you're going to be doing the landscaping, landscape design, but um, the uh, something called, it's a, the pear trees, they're flowering. Right, for pear? Yeah. I, I, I don't know if the town could handle another one of those. Okay. The dogwoods are uh, similar. They're uh, a, a softer wood tree. They don't hold up too well in the ice. And um, they don't, uh, th there's just, so what I would recommend is a blend of uh, those type of trees along with the maples and oaks. Um, there are a lot of those. Don't forget your microphone. Forty-four of the trees are either red oak, red uh, maple, or um, little leaf linden. So there's quite a few um, of larger size, and that creates the you know the canopy as you go down the road. Um, I understand the question on pears. We've heard that from several towns, but I don't know who's going to be taking care of this island if it's going to be an island of any value and the stormwater is gonna be taken care of by the homeowners, then I really do think that um, whatever we put in there, provided it's on your list, would be acceptable because of the visual aspect of that island. I think that's the whole focus of it. Large trees will go into the, underneath the pavement structure, and they'll actually come to the bottom of the hot top where condensation will create water for it and begin to lift the pavement. So we really don't want large trees in the middle of the pavement. That's my comments. Anyone else on the, on the board? Open it up to the public. Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. I'm Freddie, Gil oh, sorry. Freddie Gillespie, um, speaking as an individual, our Open Space Preservation Commission wasn't able to meet before tonight's hearing, and I did send some comments just in case to put them out there. Um, we're meeting Thursday, and I hope we'll, I expect we'll have an official letter prior to that. So um, sorry for the lateness of this one, but in case this was the last meeting, I thought it was worthwhile to uh, get some of these points out there. The main one being, and I'm not going to read the whole letter, but um, these are left over from the Open Space Preservation Commission's original letter. Um, the, I note that 
the open space uplands has been increased to the required 10 percent. However, I um, note that it's still in the very narrow strips around the perimeter and there's great concern. We know what happens to those either, well, one, they don't really provide much benefit for open space value, habitat, buffer, they're, you know, narrow, they get encroached upon, or they're already, um, you know, adjacent to the wetlands and they don't add any additional benefit. So that is one concern. We think with the moving to water, they're certainly beyond the no disturb zone in the um, plans. There seem to be more land in some of the lots that they could look at creating a more significant chunk of land than these narrow strips. Um, so that was in our original letters and I added some new ones that um, based on the, my experience reviewing subdivision plans over a decade, what the open space normally recommends, uh, the language in the easements and the decision. Some of this is coming from the recent Mass Audubon deed research project. I don't know if I need to go over those. Uh, it doesn't seem we're at that point yet and we will have the opportunity to submit a formal letter. Uh, the quote Northboro Road language, that is basically a language that was used not just on a Northboro Road subdivision but on subsequent uh, off Deerfoot Road and other subdivisions which clearly lays out the do not disturb unaltered um, condition of the open space and that should be in the decision as well as what we've heard from Mass Audubon is it should be written on the plan. One of my concerns was the table, well the original open space letter, uh, the table's on the, I believe it's on the erosion control page of the plan and the plan is one of the places subsequent property owners can look to find out that there's an easement on their property when the recommendate when the language gets dropped off deeds as they progress through subsequent ownership and that should be I don't know what's the first page that comes out but it shouldn't it seems like it's sort of tucked away on a page that uh, erosion control who's going to look at that in the future I'm not sure where we normally put it we also requested uh, the easements be called out on the the individual parcels, the size. Um, there's no way to tell like how deep it is or there's no dimensional on a lot of the um, open space easements on the plan. And then the final comment, um, is just what I was in rereading the definition as uh, Cornerstone Engineering had written in one of their letters for the requirements for the open space. We never have really looked at recommending using a single parcel for three years instead of the 10 percent un undisturbed and I, I'm going to bring that to our commission at least to consider as it's one of the possibilities and there doesn't seem to be that great of a benefit in these narrow strips that are mostly already protected from the wetland protection maybe there would be some value in considering that and recommending that to the planning board. It appears the language says that's at your discretion. So if the choice is meaningless narrow strips versus a chunk of land, even though it's only for three years, we should at least consider that and we will be um, talking about that on Thursday night. And I think the rest of it is pretty straightforward in the letter from decisions and things you've heard from the Mass Audubon project. George, our next our uh, planning board meeting is uh, July 17th. The one after that is August 14th. Uh, Mr. Morris, just a note, I'll be away on August 14th. 
So July 17th is, is still good. Would you want to come back then, George? Yes. What will I be coming back with? Um, I would uh, I'll let the board correct me. Sorry. But uh, it would seem like you would come back with a full set of plans that included the landscape plan. Yeah. You would come back with a set of plans that um, would show the uh, island yeah. and, uh, and any revised width of the remainder of the road. Um, is the board comfortable with the length of the road as a potential waiver? I am. You, George, you indicated that if if it went to, I think it was 950 feet or 900 feet? 900. Was it 900? Mm -hmm. That um, it would skew the uh, lot lines? Oh, yes. Yeah, you'd have to take, um, well, 100 feet of, uh, 100 feet of frontage away. So, yeah, we could, there'd be dog legs and crazy stuff. We can do it. That's what engineers do. <laughs> um, well, I'm open to further discussion on the waiver. This is Latrell. Yeah, I'm open for the discussion. If we can do something about the skinny strips of open space. So I can craft a request for waiver, notwithstanding our interpretation. You don't mind that language? No, because the board, the no, board would respect your opinion, but we would no, adhere to ours and yeah. and act accordingly. Right. No, okay. W one minute, please. Uh, town planner just asked about the uh, the uh, cul-de-sac. Yes. The massive uh, amount of pavement there. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I don't remember us approving one of those in a long time without a center island um, with some type of green space in there. Uh, I, I would certainly, you know, be in favor of that and, and maybe ask the town planner to look at what we've done over the last 10 or 20 years and, and see uh, to what extent uh, has worked well and, and if others have not. It's a simply a function of the fire truck going around or the school bus, those two radius, so they can make it without encroaching anything. So we, that we have those templates. And we'll just put the um, whatever it is in there. Um, I would like to be able to go and talk to the fire chief now about this as soon as I get it sketched out and make sure he's okay and email you before I finalize. That makes sense? I know Karen doesn't like Island, so I won't ask that question. What we've seen, I think, in the evolution on those islands is it used to be uh, a curbed uh, circle. Yes. Vertical curb, right. curbs. And now there's more, you see these transition pavers that go from the pavement in a little bit at a slope and then the landscaping within so that there's still a stabilized uh, area for snow storage and, and for the, the tires to roll over it, right. but it's not pavement. Well, slope granted is the best. We've seen, uh, you know, bricks and pavers. If you hit that with a plow, they're gone. Yeah. We. Uh, I guess, you know, certainly leave it to your yeah. design and your conversations with the, the public safety and, and yeah. DPW. But is it the, the, the wish of the board to try to put an island in there? Yeah, I think that's a uh, great idea. Um, the kids like it open for basketball, however. Um, on the slope curbing, I would just 
hope you stay away from sloped asphalt. No, no asphalt, not this in the center. This doesn't hold up. No, it won't. Yeah, I'd prefer the island, assuming that there's no issues with the turns for the appropriate vehicles. Do you know what DPW's um, argument with the why they don't like the islands? Takes longer to plow them. Oh. A lot longer. Yeah. I think they look better. I like them. Oh, I know. I agree. Do, do, you've got, I think you've gotten quite a few answers tonight, George, some clarity Thank you. to move forward. Uh, we will try to get, uh, you know, when you get these revised plans in, as, as, as we've arranged, you send them directly to Fuss and O'Neill now, yes. cuts down on the, on the, the middleman, and then we'll uh, ask the town planner to, you know, lean on them to make sure we don't get them on July 16th or the night of the 17th give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, address them. What we'd like is to have you come in and say, uh, we've, I've, I've come to an agreement on all of these items with Fuss and O'Neill and, and the other departments in town so that we can get to the point of a final plan on the table that the board would uh, consider for approval. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, yes. Yes, Mr. Jane. Uh, we have a July 10th deadline on this, don't we? Is that on there? Yeah, I think you're right. I think we talked about that the last time. Yeah, date for Chestnut Meadows, definitive subdivision. Lower impact development is July 10th. So that means the... Uh, Subdivision is sooner. Lid's 90. Lid is 90. Are you, uh, do you? I don't have that authority tonight. I can answer that tomorrow. For an extension? Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't have that authority tonight. I thought Mr. Wheeler would be here. If you want to give me a few minutes, I may be able to get a hold of him. Yeah, because otherwise we can't continue it to a, a date beyond the approval period. Okay, so you can table this till I get a hold of it. Yeah, them. yeah, George. Thank you. So um, we'll ta <coughs> table this for right now <clears throat> and move on to the next item, which is a discussion. 7476 Marlboro Road, release of tree escrow. Who's here for that one? I yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. I'm recused from that. Come up. Come on up. Yeah, yes. We need the uh, microphones for the, okay. for the TV. My name is David Elkinson. Why don't you hold on a second? I'm going to ask the town planner to do the intro. Okay, regarding uh, 74 to 76 Marlboro Road, the applicant um, or the owner or the former owner of the property who had provided a $3,000 escrow related to the planting of 10 white pines um, along the southern property line of 74 Marlboro Correct. Road um, was looking for a release of those escrows. And I believe it was two meetings planning board meetings ago, um, we had decided to continue the discussion when there were more planning board members available because it was a small group that evening. Um, in the meantime, um, we reviewed the file um, more and Mr. Elkinson came in to see me at, the at my office and we looked at um, the plans and the deeds and the agreement for the escrow. Um, uh, we reviewed the open space language for this particular lot 
which was included. Um, I have to say on lot 76 there, um, that deed conveyance did not mention the open space language as we both agreed to. Um, so uh, Mr. Elkinson um, indicated that the escrow itself is not based on open space requirement, but rather, you know, that he had planted the trees. And one of the board's concerns were the longevity of the trees, that they were just planted and would they last long enough. And, um, you know, in addition to that the trees be planted, the other caveat was that the, the, the planning board accepts them as well. Um, so Mr. Elkinson is back um, asking for reconsideration. Um, the trees are planted. I find, I b I'm not an expert, but I believe they're white pine. That's correct. Um, it would be helpful if you had produced like a receipt or something, but m those aren't always kept when the installer puts them in. Um, that would have also indicated if the original nursery had a warranty, which gives you a little level of comfort. If they warranty their trees for six months, they're probably going to last six months. Um, it would also confirm the type. But nonetheless, um, Mr. Elkinson's here for reconsideration of our decision to hold those until the trees prove their life. Thank you. Um, I think Karina summed it up uh, for the most part. So in November of 16, we were ready to put these homes on the market, and one of the order of conditions was to plant these eight white pines. Uh, I think it was at the request of the abutter on the other, on the other side. I, I, I don't know their name. Um, in November, when we were ready, you know, we decided we actually went to the to the home, uh, to the building inspector and said, "We're not ready to plant these now. They won't survive the winter." So we said, "Would it be okay if we plant them in the spring of 2017?" And uh, it was discussed, and he agreed, and mentioned that there would be a three thousand dollar escrow held to make sure that we planted these trees. Uh, the springtime came, as you can see, we did plant the trees, very mature trees, uh, spent a great deal of money on the trees, and uh, we wanted to plant them as close as we could to, to somebody occupying the house so they could water them and care for them, because it would have been a little onerous to go every day to water these trees. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. To back up one step, we did meet with the, the abutting neighbor when they were planted, and we did plant them in the location that they requested uh, to satisfy their needs. Uh, so with that said, the, the trees have been planted. In my opinion, they're beautiful trees. They're the white pines. As I said, they're mature. And um, th we held up our end of the bargain. And then when we came back to have the escrow released, I was notified, um, you know, it, as Karina said, it was delayed, I think, a couple of meetings. But I was, I was notified that uh, an, another order was added to that, that they survive a year, which I just thought it was an unreasonable request considering the, the deed has already been transferred to the new owners. Um, as I said, I think we, we, we did what we were supposed to do. We spent over 50% more than we left the escrow for. I mean, we could have just easily said to the town, you keep the $3,000 and, and you plant the trees. But that's not, you know, but again, we put, our, we put, as you can see, mature trees in. I think we spent about $4,500 to do so. And we're just looking for the for the release of the escrow. It was never even even if uh, the letter that we sent it was it was always considered escrow. It was never considered a bond. Um, not that that should make any difference, I guess. Uh, I, as I said, I'm just here to say we've planted the trees. They're surviving. They're good trees. Ownership has changed. There's nothing we can do to guarantee that these trees survive with the new owners there. The new owners have to water them. The new owners have to you know take care of them. Uh, we couldn't be responsible for years if, you know, there was a moth disease coming down or the caterpillars or, or whatever environmental um, pieces come, come along. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stein. I have no questions. Mrs. Littrell. Um, it should be noted that the um, deed for 76 is not in compliance with the decision. I know that has nothing to do with the trees, but. Can you elaborate on that? That it, it doesn't, the, the decision requires that the um, open space is 
mentioned on all the deeds. It's mentioned on 74, but not on 76. Uh, Karina, have you heard from the originating attorney on that? The, the attorney that actually prepared the original deed before it got conveyed to Mr. Elkinson? No. no, what I did is I looked up the deed on the registry of deeds and for both lots. Um, that's the extent to my research. And reviewed the deed and saw that there was language in one but not in the other for the open space requirement. Is that something that could the originating attorney could take a corrective action on? Do you know who that is? I think it's Mr. Schifrin. Uh, Brian Schifrin? I believe so. I can check with him. He's available. I mean, he's accessible. Okay. Mrs. Luttrell. So back to the trees. I think that, although I haven't been on the board that long, that the it had been um, the practice of the board to make sure that the trees would survive one winter, although I agree with you that's not what the, uh, the letter said when that money was held. So um. And the deed has been transferred to the new owners. I mean, there's a, they're, they're living there now. Right. Right, but you were giving an, given an occupancy permit before the um, before that was completed. Correct, just so to make sure. But again, the, the agreement was just to plant the trees. There was no language in there. They must survive a year or, or any length of time. Again, we did plant mature trees, as you, could, as you can see, mm -hmm. and we spent a, a good deal of money on them. No more questions. So you want your money, <laughs> and the town wants the deed fixed. I, I'd have to talk to her. I, haven't, I have the 74 deed here, which talks about a, an easement. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. When we bought the land, I would imagine that the, we, we're not, we weren't the ones instructed to put easements in. I believe that was done before. Those should have been in place when we bought the land. We bought the land, you know, all that work had been done prior to us even buying the land. So we can certainly look at the deed. I have no problem looking at the deed. But we're not the ones that set up those easements. So I don't think that the town never discussed those easements with us. They were part of the uh, subdivision approval. I, I don't have those here. I mean, as I said, I, we're, we're open to correcting the deed. I have no, no issue with that. I mean, that landscape, we knew about it. We knew there was a 12-foot easement on that side next to that, and that hasn't been disrupted. So if it has to be listed in the deed, again, I don't know if that's our, res our responsibility or, or Mr. Schifrin's. I, I, don't, uh, I, don't under I don't know the legal ease of all of that, of how that flow should have gone. No, when the deed was conveyed to you, was it conveyed as one lot or was it the two lots? The deed was conveyed as one lot, but the approval had already been given from the town of Southbar for two lots. Right. So that deed didn't reflect. Yeah, I think I have that deed here. The in, the, in the original deed that I have for our property, it did not mention anything. Right, because it was conveyed as one lot as if it had not already been there had not already been a subdivision approved on it, which it, I don't understand that. Right, so I don't that's, know, that's why, that's why I'm saying I don't know where that should have, I'm not even saying should have been done. We're, we're okay with it, and I think everybody knew about it too because it wasn't disturbed. So I'm not sure why the language isn't in that 76 deed, but we can certainly look at it. Okay. What I would suggest, based on your willingness to do a little homework on this, is that we continue this um, uh, to our next meeting, which is July 17th. See what homework you can get done with it. And give, And hopefully there'll be an assurance, there'll either be a revised deed or there'll be an assurance from somebody in writing that the deed will be revised to reflect the approval uh, condition uh, that, that the subdivision had. And then um, I think once we got that, uh, it sounds like the board is uh, 
can I just may I interject for a second, sure. please? My understanding about the timeline here is the proponent basically made an arrangement with the building inspector specific to the trees. So I don't see a linkage between the $3,000 and the deed correction. It's specifically linked in an arrangement to the planting of the trees, which the proponent did. So I personally have a different view on that, and I feel like we should release the funds with the understanding, although it's not linked to it, but we understand the proponent's gone on record tonight saying he's willing to help make the correction with the deed, and I'm perfectly satisfied with that. Opinion, Mimi? While I agree with everything that Mr. Stein said, there, the subdivision is not in compliance with the, um, the decision. So we can, you know, ignore that and just go through the code enforcement officer for, you know, enforcement actions, or we can just fix it all now, which I think would be cleaner and less of a headache for everybody. Can you wait until July 17th for your money? I just don't see how one connects to the other. I, I, I really don't. We've already waited four months already for our money, and I don't see, in my opinion, what's next. You, you know, the leaves aren't raked in the back, and we're going to have to make sure that owner breaks their leaves. I mean, it's just, uh, when's it going to end? There's no connection there. I don't understand why the money just can't be released. I, 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 I would, uh, and, and occupancy permits were given. I mean, that's the time when everything should have been done. I'm not saying we tried to, you know, deflect anything, but we are willing to look at the deed and find out whose responsibility it was to have that on the deed. But again, I don't think it has anything to do with the $3,000 or the trees. So we'd need a motion to uh, release the funds. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that uh, the $3,000 be remanded back to the proponent. Does anybody want to second that motion? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Please help Thanks. us with the deed. Absolutely will. Thank you. Next item on the agenda. Oh, George. We're going to go back. We had tabled uh, the Chestnut Meadow for uh, some additional information relative to uh, continuing the public hearings. Yes, I can represent that I can uh, agree to continue the hearing. Elizabeth, uh, yeah, well, we, we can fill it in. Uh, it's the form for uh, extending the the approval period for Chestnut Meadow subdivision. I'd, I'd really like to know what the date is for the subdivision and for the, the lid. This, this Usually note. Usually it's separated. I see that it's all combined, but it's really two different. The lid is 90, subdivision. Pardon me? Uh, uh, the lid is a 90 day period. It's not the 90 day, it's longer than that. Special permit? No, I'm saying there's two, and we have it written with one. And oh, okay. Agenda. Okay. It should be written, lid is, expires this date, in, I mean, the lid hearings. Okay. And here, and the subdivision, definitive subdivision is 120 days. Correct. So it's the 90 day window we're concerned with. Okay. Because that's the one that's closed. Yes. Want me to go check that? So I will agree through a 30 day extension if that lets you move along. Uh, I'll agree to request it. Okay. Uh, they're going to have to look into a few things. So, um, well, we won't. 
We're just going to have to wait a few minutes. We'll see how long this takes, George. Okay, I don't want to hold Mr. Pizzoni up. Oh, he's on the bre Brewer? Yeah. We have uh, Mr. Perry in between. Unless David's not ready, and then we, ready, yeah. we could move on to uh, the Brewer estate. Make a motion for a two-minute recess. Second. Motion, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? See you in two minutes.
So, uh, we're back in session. The current uh, approval period for the lower impact development uh, special permit for Chestnut Meadow, uh, the approval period runs to July 10th, um, and the definitive subdivision approval period runs to August 9th. Is it your desire to extend both um, approval periods to August 18th? It is. Mr. Jenks. Mr. Chairman, I move that we extend the approval period for Chestnut Meadow, zero Chestnut Hill Road, subdiv definitive subdivision and lower impact development to August 18th at the request of the applicant. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Four Thank to zero. You. That extends the approval period. Now we have to entertain a motion to continue the public hearings to uh, July 17th. That's August. Uh, what, our next meeting is the 17th. So when do you want to do it? Um, oh, after Eversource? We already continued this, I believe. So why don't we go 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock, okay, George, on the 17th? 8 o'clock on the 17th. Okay. Mr. Jenks. Mr. Chairman, I move that we continue the public hearing for Chestnut Meadow, Zero Chestnut Hill Road, Definitive subdivision and lower impact development to 8 o'clock p.m. July 17th. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? We'll see you on the 17th. You have to sign those forms. Sorry about that. Next item on the agenda. You ready, David? Did you find your tape? She can zoom. She can zoom everywhere. Put it right in front of the, uh, the, uh, the yeah. Yeah. Uh, wherever you want to sit. You just got to get the microphone, David. Oh, I'm good. Okay, it's a pity we don't have this down there. Yeah, okay. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is David Parry. I live at 22 Main Street in Southboro. Um, I'm an architect and a city planner. I was on the planning board. I was a selectman. I want to present to you tonight a concept, one concept, one alternative way of doing something very important in my opinion and I believe in the opinion of many, many residents of Southborough, namely that when we have finished the reconstruction of Main Street, that the utility poles and wires along the central part of Main Street, the historic district section, are removed forever. Now, this is an issue which has come up repeatedly in, in the last decade in the, in the design and redesign and redesign of Main Street through two different engineering consultants. First of all was SEA and then was VHB. And there's been lots of uh, swirling controversy about the scale of the road and the amount of traffic coming through and the intersection, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of that is over. It's over and done with. And the town meeting voted it through and voted to allow takings, et cetera. So that's, I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing to redesign the main street itself. That's a done deal. The main street working group is in charge of that, thank heavens. They're a good group. They're a group of experts. They are in charge and they instruct uh, our DPW 
and VHB what to do, not the other way around, by the way. But they are in charge. The selectmen put them in charge, and they are in charge of continuing to be in charge until the project is completed, because there's lots of work to do. I mean, for instance, there has been no real discussion about what's going to happen in the downtown block, because as you see on this diagram here, uh, gosh, okay, well, the purple, the present, up there is the main street, it's per, per pink, or whatever you call it, purple, is the main street reconstruction project, but it goes from Sears only as far as Park Street. It does not include the block from Park Street to Boston Road. Why not? Because that block, that last piece of road, is too narrow uh, in width to conform to state reconstruction standards, so they've refused to fund it. So the town is going to have to reconstruct pay for the reconstruction of that last remaining what we call commercial block, very, very critical block, which, by the way, I think the businessmen should be in charge of. They're perfectly capable. They know what they want, how they want it, and they can do it. But, you know, they're not yet involved, unfortunately, but I think they should be. I think mainstream working groups should invite them in and, and put them in charge of their block because they have a lot of money invested there and they would be perfectly capable of designing that block. But this is, so I'm not gonna talk now about design of the street. It's a done deal. We're all gonna live with it, even though so some of us are unhappy about it. We're gonna live with the takings and easements and heaven knows what. But, there's a huge but here. This project, I don't think, you know, who would disagree? We are the, we are the richest town, aren't we, in Worcester County, by far. We have the two finest schools in Worcester County, private schools. We have an incredible school district. We have a fantastic downtown. It's historic buildings from end to end. The Knights of Columbus building is right downtown, the oldest building in town. The old fire station, we have classic examples of adaptive reuse. All the way up the street, they're all historic buildings. What isn't historic downtown? 11 Main, that's about it. Everything else is historic. It's over 80 years old going right through past the community house, the library, the town hall, the town common, the fay houses, all the way through. Now, why is it that we've designed a street here without undergrounding the, without, I'm sorry, now I take that back, without removing the utility poles, not undergrounding, removing them, because this plan is not to underground them. I emphasize not to underground them. Why is that? Because when that was entertained and we asked SEA and VHB to address how it could be done from end to end, in other words, from Boston Road beyond the state project to Sears Road, that cost $12 million, which ironically is 1.5 times the cost of reconstruction of the road. It's quite extraordinary because of all the vaults and the, you know, the God knows what else they put in these things, incredibly expensive construction to put utilities underground with vaulting and so forth. So, you know, 12 million is crazy. The selectman probably did the right thing and says, we're not going to entertain this. We're not even going to put it to a vote. Uh, it's unfair to people in Southfield to pay for glorifying downtown. So that, that, that project was not viable. It's $12 million, and it would be our money and not the state money. Because remember, this, this, this Main Street reconstruction is state money, 8 million. Now, then we looked at undergrounding a shorter section, which was from, I think, from Latisquama through the common. That cost about six million. Again, a lot of money, almost approaching the reconstruction cost. So what, what else can we do? Because, you know, it's just crazy to reconstruct your main street. Look around us, uh, Hudson, Marlborough, you know, Worcester, Boston, you name it. You know, everyone has gotten rid of their poles somehow or, or other. And it's not always by undergrounding them. This is what's interesting. If you go to Jamaica Plain in Boston, you'll find poles behind houses. If you go to other towns, if you go to Vermont, it's common to have poles behind houses and not on the street. And that's the way they've done it in these many of the historic towns in Vermont, New Hampshire, and so forth. They put poles behind houses. They fed the power and utility into the houses from the back. Now, actually, what's interesting here in Southborough is that we're already doing that. The fire station and police station have power from the back. I don't know how to work this darn thing, but anyway, somehow or other, uh, can someone show me how to do this thing? But 
Just don't point that in anybody's eye. Oh, because it's yeah, going to no, blind no. you. Oh, I see. You what what do you, it the, the red thing? Yeah, hold it uh, down. All right, hold it down. Anyway, okay, yeah, okay, so anyway, so if this top thing, present, that's the present day. If, if you look at the dot, the dots are a schematic of the poles. They're not where the poles are, they're just a schematic where the, where the poles are. And if you look at there, that's the, by the way, that's School Street, that's Letisquama, that's 85, this is Maine, sorry about the wobbly. Um, and here you have, a, 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 there's Newton, it's the major trunk line going to Marlborough. That uh, is the main trunk line from Marlborough, and look where it goes. It goes through South for Medical, across school, through St. Mark's Land, back of police fire. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think it would help me as I view your presentation. If I have it in the context of what our objective is here tonight, Okay. are you looking for the, uh, the planning department to view your presentation and then endorse this in some fashion? Oh, I want you to endorse the concept, not the details of the plan. I think okay. this is vitally important for the town. I'm, why am I coming to the planning? So I went to economic development. Uh, you know, they, said, well, they said it was quite incredible, actually. I'd never been to them before. They said, blow me. I don't know why this hasn't been done before. Why aren't we doing it even underground? And that was their comment. You know, now, now I'm coming to you because ultimately this is a town meeting issue. It's a political issue. It's a funding issue. And it's going to cost us some money, but it's extraordinarily important because, you know, it can completely transform downtown, not just with a new pavement with more cars, by the way, a bigger intersection, more cars, but you can get rid of the ugliest thing downtown, which is poles in the sky, wires in the sky. I could have photographs of how ugly it all is. Yeah, and, the, and the remarks people say about our downtown, it's almost like embarrassment. So I, I'm coming to the planning board to ask you to endorse the concept, however it's done, however the detail is done, of removing the poles. Let's get something to town meeting and so them make the decision on how much money they're going to spend to get rid of the polls. Now, they may vote no, but they certainly deserve the right to vote. Now, here, let me just go back to this thing. We're already serving. There's police fire, and you'll see that line goes in back of police fire. So, lo and behold, police fire are served from the back. Now, here we go over here. There's town hall. There's the, there's the congregational church. There's town hall. There's the Episcopal church. Well, lo and behold, the power lines come down St. Mark's Road, right behind this building, past the historical building, which is right about there, and they feed the back of Town Hall. Same thing with, with all, you know, the head, head of St. Mark's and these buildings up here. They're fed from the back, not the front. So what, you have lots of strong, long section of Main Street with no wires crossing them at all. In fact, where I live, which is somewhere, where is it? God, library, okay, somewhere here. There's two lines crossing Main Street crossing Main Street, right? Not, there's a lots of lines going along it, but there's only two lines going across it, to the White House opposite my house there, and to the Campbell's house. Now, why do they cross when they could be just fed from the north? You see, just intuitively, you can see there's a solution right there, because you can feed them from the north. So anyway, so here's an idea, and this is not new, because I just said, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, all over the place they're doing it, they move the poles to behind the houses. So let's look at what's important here. Now, we could take it all the way down, we could spend a lot of money, because what, what we have to do, we have to build a trunk line, an alternative trunk route of poles carrying the power lines and the, and the cable somewhere linking Boston Road, Newton at that end and Sears Road at that end. Now, do we have to do all of that? No, we don't, because some would argue that the important section is not to go all the way down to Sears. The important section is really from, in my opinion and many others, is from the main entrance to Faye School, which is where? Where is it now? Okay, there's the tennis courts, right? There, there's the head, there's, uh, the head, the headmaster's house of uh, St. Mark's. There's the Fay Tennis Courts. There's the Burnett Cemetery. There's the town hall. So here is the main entry to Fay, right there. So the important section of our historic area, and you're going to create this historic district, aren't you? Runs from there, 
all the way down to there. So actually, it's only about half, slightly more. By the way, this is not to scale. It's, a, it's a, just a diagram, isn't it? It's a, it's a sketch, in deliberately, deliberately a sketch. It doesn't pretend to be an engineering thing. So if you jump down here, let's go down to future which is everything below this zigzag line, everything below the zigzag line is future. Now, everything you see is the same over here, but yellow, yellow would be the area with no poles. And you see it runs from Newton, Boston, and then it goes all the way down the street, crosses Latisquama, crosses 85, past the common, all the way to that arrow, which is the entrance to Faye School. So all of the frontage of Faye School all of the frontage of the common, the townhouse, the library, St. Mark's, the uh, main block of houses, and downtown is yellow, and that would be rid of poles. Now, how do we do that? Where do the new poles go? The new trunk line. So we reconnect Boston Newton there to there, because we're not doing the whole thing. We're not going to Sears, we're going to the Fay entrance. And by the way, I've been to the to the business manager of Fay and St. Mark's, and they're very excited about this. I didn't talk money, I just talked concept. This is their front yard. Actually, it's our front yard, isn't it? This is our front yard, and by God, you know, if we don't take the opportunity to improve it and beautify it, we're just crazy, in my opinion. Now, how, where's the alternate route? Because we have to reconnect the power poles, Newton, Boston, <coughs> that's the trunk there, to the trunk over here. How do we reconnect? How, if we get rid of the yellow, if the yellow is no poles, we need a line which connects there to there, and there it is in red. You see, it runs from Boston Road behind Morrow's to Park Street. Then it's, po you see, it's red, red dots are new poles, new poles behind Morrow's to Park Street, down Park Street to a pole on Park Street. Okay, I'm gonna jump across that section for a minute. Then, it, then you see it jumps up from, jump across, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. The, right here, you see it's behind Woodward. Now today, they're cutting down trees on Woodward. By the way, it's incredible coincidence. You know, why are they cutting down trees at the north end of Woodward? Because there's at least 20, if not 100, massive dead trees, two foot, three foot diameter. They've been falling down, it's a miracle no child has been killed. And it's qu completely coincidental but the, you know, the principals there and the uh, superintendent have ordered them, uh, you know, a cutting program immediately schools out because they're dangerous to kids. Now, it's quite extraordinary, this, because it actually opens up the opportunity. We could do it or have done it anyway, but it opens up the opportunity to, to put the lines on Woodward School property and through the wood because the dead trees have been cut. So actually, you won't even notice that trunk there. So it goes down through a property there, who I've already spoken to, the owner, and he says, go ahead, David, because this is going to increase my property value, and it's going to run north of Woodward, and then it goes down 85, it goes through the senior center over to Middle. So we reconnect Middle. And by the way, you only see it goes up 85, blue is underground. Let me jump across that a minute. It goes up 85, see the red there? It goes over to St. Mark's Road, then it goes behind Town Hall, then it goes up. Now, we've got a problem here because of Burnett Cemetery and Town Hall. How do we cross there? We have to go north of the Burnett Cemetery. So that section is blue, which means it's underground. Now, that's, that's what I talked to St. Mark's about. They don't want, obviously, utility poles running down the, head, the driveway to the head's house. So it's a short section there, but as soon as we're there, you're to the tennis courts. You see the squares. By the way, they're up there well in the exit present. You run around the tennis courts, and if you go up there, it's, it's blummin' obvious to you how they can run because there's massive trees there, and the poles will disappear into the trees. And it comes down there past the tennis courts, through the trees, right out at Fay Campus entrance. Wow. I went to the Fay business manager. He says, it's kind of like a no-brainer, David. Why didn't we think of this before, was his attitude. Now, okay, let's do the, the little complications here. I've got another alternate which is cheaper. But there you see blue there, and you see blue there and blue there. So a three short section of undergrounding, which cannot be avoided unless you want short section of undergrounds on main, short sections of overhead on main. If you want the continuous block, you've got to take it to the end of, end of Park Street. There's a pole right there. 
The, then the wires dive down, they go underground 200 feet, they come up the pole already there, and then they go across a private property to Woodward. That property owner has said yes. He's the only property owner from which we need an easement other than Moros. I met with a new owner of Moros today. He said, right on, I'm for it. I'll give you the easement. And by the way, I spoke to Baltus and the, any other pizza people. They're absolutely for it. In fact, they're irritated. It's quite frankly true this. They're irritated because like five years ago, they put a lot of money into a scheme to get rid of the poles through undergrounding, and they were stubbornly rejected and resent the fact that it was never taken to a vote. You know, they think they had a right to, because they spent tens of thousands. It never went anywhere. Not even a, not even a section in front of the common. never went in. No one was given a vote even. So anyway, they said, yes, do it. Now, so it goes, dives down on a pole. It comes up on a pole. That one person has said, yes, that's public, that's public, that's public. How, how do we get it to middle? Okay, I'm asked by a certain person at a certain meeting, well, David, you haven't figured out which house on middle you're going to run it through. They're going to object. You know, I meet with the phase school director. You know what he says? Simple, David. We, have two, we own two houses on middle road. Choose which one you want. Ha! So that's their attitude. In other words, it works and make it work. Now, okay, so that, you, see, you see how it works. So the alternate route is south, there, but it goes up 85. Now, why is it blue there? Because you don't want, that's a bad enough intersection, it's going to be like lights galore, it's traffic signals galore, so we dive down and we put about 200 feet underground and come up beyond the library. The, all those poles, the black poles, exist. They're not new, only the red ones are new. There and there. So here we're going blue under 85, under main, existing poles, then we're going across there, up underground, a short section along the driveway, not under the driveway, under the grass. And then we're out, and that's a free, and some fairs said, yes, of course you can have an easement, no brainer. Now, what's interesting is, suddenly talking to Faye's school, I realized, wow, this is an actual solution way cheaper. Because you see this, this, this detail up here. This detail is, is trying to get around this, this problem, the Burnett Cemetery. That's the block. We cannot go through the Burnett Cemetery. So there it is underground, uh, you know, ne next to their baseball field. And then it cuts, and then it's along north of the tennis courts, there and there, and it goes south. Here it's fine, there we have to do that. Now I say, oh my God, okay, how much money are we spending here? A lot, because underground costs a lot, and a foot costs a lot. So uh, unfortunately, that's un it's a damn nuisance. Then, I'm talking to the Extraordinary, you know, the, the phase school um, business manager, he says, come on, let's think. There has to be another way of doing this. And it suddenly occurs to us, and credit, you know, the business manager's Fay, you know, he says, what the heck? Let's go to alternate two. Where is alternate two? Where's my sheet of, where's my big board? Up there. Oh, okay, here it is. <laughs> Sorry. Take the mic with you, uh, David. Okay, do you want me to carry this thing? How do you do that? Okay, am I on? Have I been speaking loudly enough? Okay, good. All right. Well, anyway, so, okay, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand this side, because you have the diagram, right? I want this camera, or whatever. Is the camera there? Hold on. Okay, so no one can see the red pointer. Okay, well, that's good to know. I'm sorry, folks at home. Uh, what can I say? You know, call me and I'll give you the diagrams for free or call up the town planner, pick them up for free. I've got lots of colored copies. It's blooming obvious when you look at the colored copies. Anyway, I ha the, here's the other scheme, which when I meet with, with Faye School business manager, he says, whoa, David, there's a much simpler solution. Well, here's, the, here's the diagram you all just saw. I'm sorry you couldn't see the red pointer. Anyway, if we have to forget all that and get over it. You know, that's the problem up here wherein this is the future, where we had to go through blue up here uh, north of the Burnett Cemetery, because obviously it's a historic cemetery. You don't want to have wires and cables. But, you know, so instead of, instead of doing the northerly route, we come over to this scheme, which is identical here. The eastern end is identical. You know, back of Moros, up, to f up Park, down under for 200 feet at Latisquama, over on Pearls to Woodward, 
through the north end of Woodward, through the trees, down 85. But we keep going down 85. So here we go. Now here, here is, is at present, and you see there's the big black dotted lines which show them the trunks are actually 85, uh, and Newton, Boston, and Maine. Those are the main trunks, although every street has poles. That's the major trunk. Well, here we have the new trunk. And you see, it's supposed to show, I'm sorry, the scale is not right. But, uh, you know, here up to, where's 85? Here's, 80, here's 85. There's 85 right there. So everything up to 85 on the east side will be identical using Woodward. Then it's different. Then instead of going to the senior center and over to, uh, oh, am I speaking to you? Instead of going through, uh, instead of going through, um, Woodward to 85 and then going through the senior center, what we do is carry on all the way down. Down past the cemetery, past the golf course, and wow, well there it is. There's a transmission line, which, which very few people are aware of because they're not gigantic pylons in the sky. They're quite low, aren't they? And they're painted blue or green. And so no one notices. We actually have a major electric high voltage transmission line in South but already, and it runs along this corridor around the lake, it runs literally around the edge of the lake. So we go down to it, and we, then we go along it, all the way over to Parkerville. To Par then we go up Parkerville to Maine. We've done it. All of a sudden, we've connected Boston Road to the other end of Maine by using the transmission line. And the amazing thing is the transmission line has a road along it. And what National Grid, by the way, National Grid is the agency which will design this, says the one thing they want is a driveway to access the poles, and lo and behold, the transmission line has a driveway. In fact, there's a walkway along it. You know, it's one of our circuit trails. So here's a, s here's a solution. And by the way, you know, the purple is the, uh, is the um, Main Street Reconstruction Project. I'm sorry, you can't really see it, but red, I've tried to indicate red is where the piece is where you have no poles. So let's see this. We got it over to Parkerville. It comes up to Maine. Now, we keep the poles to the east to face school entrance because they're not a problem. They're not in a historic area. And then we've done it. We're home free because from that pole at the Fay entrance, you can feed into Fay and St. Mark's. So here's a solution which is, has only two pieces of underground. One is at Latisquama Road, and the other one is under 85. So I'd put that to you now. Let me just explain the procedurally. National Grid is the operator. National Grid is obliged, when a town applies to do this, they apply to National Grid. National Grid then requires money to design it, about 60000 We have to pay them 60000 Please design an alternate so we can get rid of our poles. This is the procedure everyone goes through. National Grid then designs it. They come back with the design, which may not be this design. Of course, it's their design, and they said it's going to cost X. So if we're going to do this, what we need is we need 60 grand. We don't have it. We're going to have to have a special town meeting at which we asked for 60,000 from the town residents to design it, to study it, to figure it out, and to answer this most significant question of all, what's it going to cost? They will determine the cost. They'll come back with the design, and, and the annual town meeting, hopefully, will have the national grid design and will have the cost. And it's going to be way, 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 way less than 12 million. I'm not going to put a number because I'm not the ne electrical engineer. But what we're doing is now one other technicality here. The key to this, to making it work, is this. That the current design moves almost every pole. Five feet, one feet, two feet, 20 feet. Every pole is moved. Who's paying for that? National Grid. 50% is being paid for by National Grid. So, there's a gigantic incentive for National Grid to get on with this project because what we should tell them is, wow, leave the poles exactly where they are. Don't move them at all until you've built the new trunk. Then take down the old trunk and wire up the new trunk. So they don't have to move a, a any pole, five feet, two feet, one feet, 20 feet, whatever it is. Just leave them in place. So what if we have a year with a pole in the middle of a sidewalk? I mean, God heavens, you know, look down Southville Road there are, and Boston Road. There's poles all over the place in sidewalks. It's not a big deal. So we might have to... So let me say one other thing. 
This will not slow down the construction of Main Street. No, no, no. It will allow Main Street to continue on time next March, full speed ahead. What we're doing here is saying in parallel, we have National Grid design the alternate trunk. They sign on. We, f we vote to fund it in town meeting, right? Whatever, however much it costs. And it's not going to be cheap, but it's not going to be anywhere approaching 12. And then what we do is we, s we reconstruct Maine, and we hope to bring National Grid online fast, leave the poles where they are, put the new poles in on the new trunk, and then serve the houses from behind. Okay, have I said enough? Have I covered it? We have a question here, David. Okay. Uh, David, um, when we were talking about this project in the past, when you come to the office, you mentioned a few um, groups that you spoke with who, um, can you tell us what groups have already kind of endorsed you? Okay, well listen, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, Ray or endorsed your plan, I should right. say. Okay, official endorsements. I'm starting with you guys. You know, you're important. You are the planning board. You are the board which is supposed to set the tone and future of our town. So I'm here before you formally first. I did go to economic development because I noticed they had a meeting. And mm -hmm. I just inserted myself at the end of the meeting and I got mm -hmm. this incredible welcome from them, from David McKay. He says, fantastic, I don't know why we haven't done this before. What okay. other, but what other groups have you met with? Not just formally, groups. but... I've met with dozens of people. I've met mm -hmm. with dozens of homeowners. I met with the business manager of Fay and St. Mark's. Mm -hmm. I met with Baltus. I met with a new owner of Morrow's Market. Can you quantify, like, in talking to all those people, what percentage would you say you had favorable, like, were 60% yes. on board, 50%? Did you get a sense? A hundred. Wow. A hundred on sure? board. Are you sure? Okay. One hundred percent on board. Oh, in fact, there was one so instance where I was informed by someone who remained unnamed that someone was opposed. So I went to see them. Now, you know what they were opposed to? They were opposed to the street and the traffic. They weren't opposed to the poles at all. They weren't opposed to, I mean, to removing the poles at all. They wanted the poles removed. You see, and they didn't realize that, you know, well, they didn't want a pole in their backyard. You don't have to have a pole in your backyard. You can string it from house to house. David, I one more question. Right. Um, also, when you talk about the $60,000 right. for national grid costs, was there any interest of other parties um, funding that as a incentive because they're getting improvement along there? Well, you see, this is a very, very I, I'm not going to throw out percentages because many people should say that certain parties should pay for this. You know, Did you have other interest? Like, were uh, other people interested? No, in I it? haven't had anyone beg, go down on bended knee and say, here's the money. Uh, um, but many people have suggested formulas for who should pay. But, you know, I'm not going to get into that. And Dave McKay said that's way premature. You know, 60000 is not a lot of money to figure out a solution, you know, which could transform Southborough. All I can say is I've hit 100% positive, zero negative after talking to this one individual who was against the traffic and the lights and the, and the reconstruction, the taking. That's what they don't like. They like the idea of getting rid of the poles. And by the way, the gentleman who owns the White House, you know, back on scheme one, where, where it goes from the old realty thing down back to Woodward. You know, it's very interesting. I meet with him, a little anecdotal story. He's in a wheelchair, David, he's 85. David, uh, we're way over time. I'm gonna open this up to the okay, board. Yeah, uh, Mr. Jenks, any questions or comments? Uh, David, thank you. I, I think you said it all when you said it depends on the cost. Right. And until we get some feel for the cost, I, I wouldn't even give you an okay for concept. It's totally the money. Uh, okay, but Phil, can I just address that? There's nothing stopping you from saying that the concept makes sense. Now let's figure it out and let's determine the cost. What stops me from saying the concept makes sense is not knowing how much it's gonna cost. Okay. Because at $500 million, it doesn't make sense. At $10, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, I agree, totally. Mr. Stein. 
<clears throat> uh, so a couple issues I have is, um, I'm, and maybe you said it and I missed it, but uh, the Main Street Working Group, um, talking to the abutters and the EDC, that's great, but this seems to be in conjunction with the Main Street Project, yeah. correct? Yeah. And if I'm it's in conjunction with the Main Street Project, why wouldn't we start with the Main Street Working Group? Because we are. it's sort of a fundamental... Okay. Uh, okay, we are. I mean, it's I'll hard for me as a planning board member to get behind this without having some notion that logistically it's feasible from the perspective of the Main Street Project and, you know, sort of woven into that um, s scheme, if you will. And then the other aspect of it is the $60,000 exploratory cost with Eversource National, National grid. grid, excuse me. At the end of that sixty thousand dollars, could they not come back to us and say, you know, we looked at the at the the, the lines and and the power needs, et cetera, and it actually isn't logistically possible, isn't physically possible. That could happen, right? Okay. Well, let me let me address both of those issues. I am going to the Main Street Working Group. The only reason I haven't yet gone to them is because they were unable to meet because certain of their members are out of the state or out of the country. They're going to meet in two weeks, and they are going to have VHB present, the engineers who designed the street. And VHB is now reviewing these two concepts, concept one, which is the northerly track, or other, you know, they're both identical, aren't they, east of 85. They're both south on 85. Then alternate one is north of Maine, alternate two is south of Maine. VHB is going to look at that in detail. Right now, they're doing it. They're going to come back with some suggestions, refinements, whatever else, and how to go about it, how to approach National Grid. National Grid is in charge. Of course, it's totally uh, you know, conceptually possible that they could say, no, go, go and take a hike. Y you know, but have they done that to Hudson, Marlborough, Boston, Newton, you, know, you name it? No, because where there's a will, there's a way. So, so David. Uh, Along the lines of what Phil was questioning, after the 60000 that's when we get the cost estimate for the town? Yes, that's the only way. That is the only I way. I mean, so my feedback is, you know, just looking at these, these drawings, that you, okay, maybe that's great. But good from between this and getting behind a warrant article at town meeting, even for the 60000 there's a number of things that would have to be cleared in my mind. Like? Well, how about a written endorsement from the EDC, for one right. thing? How about the Main Street Working Group's endorsement right. and how logistically that, that would work? Um, and some more assurance in some form that the $60,000 isn't just going to be thrown out the window with the, with the answer being, like Phil said, it's going to cost $500 million. Yeah. Or, you know, we, we kind of need a little bit uh, more. Uh, okay, but let me... I, I, I need a little bit more um, okay, but let's, let's be to go on you know, before... Don't, don't hang, on a sec, hang on a sec, please. Okay. I need a little bit more to go on in terms of, you know, so, someone to hang my hat on right. before I go to the town and ask for $60,000 out of the general fund to support this concept. Yeah. Okay, but, let's, let, but let me just address that. You know, please, don't throw out $500 million because we know that the top figure was 12 and that was undergrounding it from Boston Road to Sears Road. So we know it can't possibly approach anywhere near 12. It's going to be a fraction of 12. Fraction of 12. I don't know what the number is. I'm not going to put a number, but don't talk about 500. It's not going to be, you know, it's, that's, that's, it's not, you know, it's going to be way less than 12. Way less than anything else we've ever looked at. And I totally agree. I mean, Main Street Working Group has to endorse it. Yes, I'm going to hand the whole darn bailiwick out to them and out to VHB and tell the VHB, is the, they are the technicians, figure out what poles you're going to move, which ones you want. And I know I've walked it with, I've walked it with like five or six residents, John Wilson, you know, uh, um, Hokanson, you know, the Baltuses, a lot of people, that they, you know, the business managers of both schools, it's bloody obvious when you walk out there where the poles should go. I'm not going to count them, five, six, seven, but where they go is pretty darn obvious. You know, I just put it to you that, that way. So VHB at the meeting in two weeks is going to give a... So anyone interested in a technical review of this, please come to the meeting 
I, I'm not sure what day it is, but I think it's like a Wednesday or Thursday in two weeks' time, here, before the, I hope it's here, I'm not quite sure, of the Main Street Working Group. It'll be posted. It's going to be a very, very important meeting that people voice their opinions about, you know, because of course there are going to be hurdles and, s you know, s tricks and, you know, all the rest of it. But I totally agree. You're right on the ball. Mrs. Luttrell. Thank you, David. It's an interesting concept. Um, I agree with my colleagues. There's a, there are a lot of unanswered questions. The other question is National Grid. What do they, how do they feel about wires buried in trees? Aren't they cutting limbs down all the time, trying to keep wires away from trees? Uh, yes, yes, they do. They do not. What National Grid wants is they're, they're, and you'll see this all over the place, unless they put them underground, which is fearfully expensive, and this is not underground, is it? It's poles above ground. What they're interested in is having the poles aligned close to a driveway so they can access to the poles. They prefer the driveway to be on public property, and lo and behold, this is, because it's Woodward, 85, transmission lines, Parkerville. It's public property. There is not a single pole on private property which is really quite amazing, not one. So their interest is having access to the poles. You know, now it's their duty, they cannot avoid not studying it. If a town votes, a city votes, and of course thousands of them have, you know, we want, to, we want you to study a way of moving our poles, they must study it. They cannot say no, they must do it. All they can say is it's gonna cost you X to, to look at it. And we'll come back with the schematic. We're going to tell you what we think are the sort of best alternates, not the alternate, because it's a participatory process. The town, DPW, and engineers have a say in that. They come back with alternates, and they come back with a cost estimate. So if we go through this at a future town meeting, you know, whatever the outcome, the preferred alternate is, let's say it's alternate two, they would, we would have that. That would be presented probably by VHB, I would think, since they're the engineers um, of record, and there would be a cost number to it, and it would be a real cost, because it would be a commitment by, by National Grid to do it. That is the real design, that is the real cost. No ifs, ands, or buts. We didn't design it, National Grid designed it. Um, were you all set, Mrs. Luttrell? What I would suggest, David, uh, it sounds like the board uh, would like to get you to uh, meet up with the uh, uh, Main Street group uh, first, um, does the board have any objections to us putting these on our website so that the, the townspeople, they're, they're watching it tonight and they would have access to these um, on our website? Uh, I, I would have no objection to that as long as it doesn't indicate at this point that we support the concept. Yeah, I was just thinking the exact same thing. I'm concerned about some sort of tacit endorsement or um, that, that just isn't in place right now for me. Well, if it's just put online as information that was presented at as a meeting, at the meeting, yeah, with no endorsement from the planning board. I have no problem with that. Mm. Is that all right, David, if we yeah, put this? Yeah, yeah, well, but could I just, some people have shown up here. Can you ask them if they have any opinion, please? Quickly. Anyone have any opinion? Uh, seeing none. Yes. Uh, yes, John. John Callanan. John Callanan, 21 Latisquamer. I don't have a question, but I would like to make a statement that I believe Mr. Perry's plan would contribute to the enhancement of the proposed Main Street reconstruction. And if it is physically and financially doable, I would ask this board to seriously consider his proposal. Phil Bassoni, One Admiral's Lane. Uh, I just have a question, David. Have you talked to CSX yet? Because it looks like you have a pole connection coming across the railroad tracks to your pink pole. And right now, getting an easement from CSX or something like that, you're probably on a three to five year program to get it. And I'm just wondering if you've talked to them yet 
because right now I believe it goes underground at the crossing on Main Street. Um, well, it, okay, let's address that. No, it doesn't go underground, but it goes over. It goes over the railroad and Main Street. The poles go over. The wires go over. So, so we would we would just be doing exactly the same thing. We'd be going over. Now you're quite right. Obviously, it's a different location, but but there are other lines over. I mean, for instance, the top line there. You know, you see Newton to the police station goes over. So if we had to, if it's like a four-year bureaucratic idiocy delay, we could just take, you know, just tie into the line which is already over, uh, which is goes through the South for Medical, and then bring the poles down. I mean, there are ways around this. I, I, you know, obviously we, people are going to throw bricks at us and so forth, but, you know, I can't believe National Grid's not going to oppose it. You know, we have to commit, we, we say we the, if we the town want it, you know, you work on it. Because you have an incentive right here. You're going to pay 50% of moving poles for no reason whatsoever. But I agree with that. All of these are technicalities. You're absolutely right, Bill. There's a, someone has to deal with that. You know, I can't. Any other uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, um, we'll uh, find a place on our website to put these sketches, David, and wish you luck moving okay. forward. And you're welcome to come back any time. Okay, I appreciate, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your hard work. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, Brewer Estates. Mr. Pizzoni. Mr. Chairman. Did, uh, did you want to say anything, uh, Karina, first? Oh, I believe um, Mr. Pizzoni is here to present um, a deed and a plan to show the planning board as part of a planning a prior um, decision, a condition that's required as part of the decision. All right. If if I may, uh, Bill Pisoni, I represent uh, New England's uh, Center for Children uh, that has acquired this. Pro uh, one of their trustees has acquired the property, Diane Kim, and she is developing it and presently building one home up there for the autistic kids that are matriculating out of the program because they're too old, but it, they'll be close to the facility and they'll be going there. When you approve this for major site plan review and flexible development, you put certain requirements that we identify. When was that? Oh, God. <laughs> I knew you'd ask me that. 2012. And they're just getting around to building it. Um, the... Uh, you had us identify the open space parcels, A and B, uh, which are on the plan behind you. There's B and A is up there. The, we had that plan prepared, you endorsed it, and we recorded it, which showed those plans. Part of the other objectives under the approvals, you wanted us to uh, make notations on a plan when we were recording it with a deed restriction on it in that uh, there would be a deed restriction that would impact all of the lots and any building that would go on there and would protect the parcel A and parcel B as open space. Uh, I presented to you today a potential deed from Diane Kim to the uh, LLC which will be uh, creating the uh, condominium which I've got the condominium documents to all set and ready to go. And in it, it references uh, the open space A and B will be subject to a deed restriction to be included in all future deeds of conveyance noting, and then I have the open space language, which it would read, open space A and open space B, collectively the property, shall be used exclusively for open space and passive recreational uses for the owners of the condominium units and their guests Passive recreational uses shall exclude parking, but shall include hiking and walking trails for use by the unit owners without motorized vehicles, uh, recreational activities which do not require formalized playing fields or areas such as picnicking, fishing, or environmental education. Notwithstanding the foregoing, the Southport Conservation staff, Commission staff and employees may from time to time view the property for emergency purposes and routine review and no building, residential dwelling, structure, parking lot, or other structure improvement requiring construction shall be placed on the property other than unpaved footpaths and trails and improvements necessary or appropriate to assure safe passage, prevent erosion, or protect or enhance the natural habitat. 
that will be included in the master deed for the condominium and each deed out to each unit owner will specifically lay that on there. So it will be placed in perpetuity and I know the issue was uh, the unit owners that when they're conveying these are gonna know that it's open space and they can't be building on it and can't go on back there. It'll be in every single deed and it will be in the master deed. So we, I'm here before you so that you can review it. I tried to get it to you last week. Uh, and to look at the plan, I'll just run over the plan real quickly. It's just an enhancement of the original plan which showed the three lots and the driveway, the septic area, and then the building lot areas where the three, five, four buildings would be, five buildings would be placed and where the each units would be. I would point out in the original plan, Don, when we were before you, uh, one of the duplex was where building three is located. Uh, we moved that to the back so there'd be bigger uh, exclusive use area around the condominium units for people to use as yards. Uh, and we just, we just changed that up. And that's the only change that we've had to the plan. I'll just put this out there. As you know, and hopefully the public knows, that we, uh, the planning department, um, does not operate in a vacuum. We reach out to other boards and commissions uh, as a routine each day, um, depending on which sites or parcels of land we're dealing with throughout the town. We were told that the DEP inspected the site and found uh, some non-compliance with uh, a, a superseding order of conditions. There were uh, issues with runoff onto Route 30, complaints from Genzyme, not uh, keeping up with the site stabilization, and uh, inspections that were uh, conducted after the rains. You know anything about this, Bill? Yeah, I do. Uh, actually, Cornerstone met out there with the uh, DEP and went to see them, and it's my understanding they came out again. Everything was in place. They feel that it's, it's under control now, as, as far as I know. I haven't heard anything else since that time. Uh, I do know that the site contractor was reprimanded to make sure that things were kept in place uh, and that it wasn't running out onto the highway. Uh, or even down the sides of the hills. We wanted to keep it within the confines of the roadway and keep it controlled. Uh, that's in place. Uh, I can only send the message back to them to make sure they keep it in place. Uh, Open it up to the board, Mr. Jenks. No questions. Mr. Stein. Uh, Mr. Brazzoni, what is it you're seeking from the planning board? Under, my, under the approvals for the uh, major site plan review and the flexible development, uh, we would have come back to you and show you what the uh, restriction, the deed restriction was gonna look like and that it would be put on the plan, a plan of record going on record, which that condominium uh, and exclusive use area plan is a chapter 380 plan, which will go on record once it's stamped by the, uh, the, uh, the engineering firm that's confirming all the, uh, all the different data on it. And if you note, there's an exact replica of what the deed restriction is noted on that plan, as well as the planning board approvals. When was this originally approved? March of 2012. Um, why, what's happened in the last five years? I guess since then, what, why why hasn't the, this been built the, yet, and why why are you coming back? It was to us a now? foreclosure. The <laughs> bank, or the lender, took it over. So your client didn't own it in 2012. My client didn't, but another client did. <laughs> so okay. one client developed it. Yeah. Bank foreclosed, and the bank hired me to come in and finish up getting the approvals. What status is the construction? It's the roads in, the uh, septics in, all the drainages in, and they're building one of the units right now. Just out of curiosity, so at the time it was foreclosed, it was in it was that was raw a, land. That was all done. No, it was all raw land. It was nothing. It was nothing. So your your client bought it in foreclosure, 
has taken it to the current well, status. Brought it after foreclosure. Right. Yeah. And has brought it to the current status. Correct. Okay. And it's coming back to us now to revise the open space because I'm going to need you guys to look at the uh, language in this plan in order to get my building permit. <laughs> I'm not building, but occupancy permit. Okay. Maybe I can help Jesse. This is the uh, decision of major site plan approval dated March 2012. Okay. And, you know, it's the usual uh, procedural history um, that's documented. It lists all of the correspondence and plans, um, the findings, and then um, a decision of the board with conditions. And condition number three says, open space parcels as shown on the revised plan shall be owned by the condominium association and protected by a deed restriction. Okay, I gotcha. think we heard those words a few minutes ago from yep. Mr. Pisoni. Copy okay. of the proposed deed restriction shall be submitted to the planning board for review with plans for endorsement. I would recommend submitting it to the Open Space Commission also for their review. I mean, I, I take their feedback fairly seriously. And yeah, I, I, I mean, they were very much involved when we uh, had this okay. approved, and actually, Ms. Luttrell was uh, very vocal at that time <laughs> uh, and I don't have a problem with them looking at it but uh, I think it should go through your office to them um, the language is pretty standard on what we use to uh, restrict property like this and we didn't want at the time when we talked about it we didn't want it for public access either and I think this board recognized that and it was just for the condominium. And you're looking for feedback from us before you actually, you know, schedule a hearing? Is that the idea? No, I don't have to schedule a hearing. I just have to come in to you to look at this and tell me that it's, it meets with your approval. So are we expected to vote tonight? No. Okay. No. We just... There's going to be another public we, we hearing. We need to have uh, town council take a look at it. But right. the highlighted, these two here, three, and three, four, and five, if you want to read them, that's basically what Mr. Pizzoni is trying to do here tonight. Yeah. He's, start, he's starting that process. Yeah, it's, it's uh, normally after the decision is obtained, there are certain benchmarks that you have to meet. Like in that one, actually, we had to put uh, bounds and drill holes. We had to get uh, insurance policies and did, had to do seismic uh, review and all of that. Uh, and I'm just finishing up the last, you know, issues here which is the language of the restriction and showing you what the plan is going to look like the final plan thank you it usually doesn't stretch out over five years but that's what's happening. no it here. doesn't and it, it you know the market turned and the, 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 the little bank was holding it and but, the, but for New England Children's Center the need for this uh, this is one of the trustees of the New England Children's Center that bought the property he has a son that's there. Mrs. Luttrell. Thank you. I'm glad to see the uh, restriction right on the plan. That's good. Um, the decision says that the open space shall be owned by the condo association. Is that LLC the condo association? It will be the developer of the uh, condominium association. And the uh, master deed will be to them, you know, creating the association. Um, the other thing that we learned through our deed research project is that these deed restrictions need to state a time period, like 100 years or something. This is in perpetuity, I believe. No, if it doesn't state a time period, it expires in 30 years, which is why we need it to state a time period so it can be re-recorded in 100 years. What do you want, 90? How many years? Or a hundred. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, if it isn't in perpetuity, it's a life in, in being. So, in twenty years. So that's that's not quite a hundred years. I don't think. <laughs> there's there's a rule of law that we have to stick to, and that's why I was looking at Phil. Uh, I think I could do ninety years, and that would be within the confines of it. I'd prefer to put in perpetuity, but. Uh, you say that will go away in 30 years? 
Yeah, I think you need to state a, a time period on deed restrictions. Conservation restrictions are in perpetuity. But okay. deed restrictions, if there's not a, uh, a stated period of time, then they expire in 30 years and they can't be. Yeah, but in perpetuity is a stated a time. time. That's forever. <laughs> Well, that, so that I'm, as you know, not an attorney, so I'm not yeah. going to argue law with you. I just know what Mass Audubon said and said to state a, a time period. I don't know if that, if in perpetuity would work. Maybe that's a question for town council, which he would have to review um, okay. this. Actually, I didn't put in perpetuity here. I should have. That's what I usually have. Um, yeah, I'll see what town council wants on it. And if he wants 90 years or 100 years of in perpetuity, we don't care. The intent is that it will remain open space. And the other concern is a LLC, that those tend to be temporary. No, the LLC will be the developer of the condominium association. And as such, the, the LLC will operate the condominium association until they sell off all the units and then they'll have their own association that'll run it. It's like every, every condo association. And yeah. then will the open space revert to the condo association? It reverts to the condo association when I record the master deed. Oh, okay. When you record the master deed, you record bylaws, you know, our rules and regulations, and it, it lays it all out on what they can do and what they can't do on the property and how you manage it. And there's, the description from this deed will go right in there. Okay. Anyone else want to speak? Yes. Um, Freddie Gillespie, I'm speaking as an individual, but I am chair of the Open Space Preservation Commission. Thank you for letting me ask some questions. I, I wasn't aware of this, so it sounds like, without looking at any of the documentation, it sounds like it's doing what we wanted it to do Correct. when we originally, but let me just ask, there's been no change in the layout of the open space? No. Some of the buildings have been moved? The buildings, uh, building number three, which is that one, Okay. used to be the duplex. We moved okay. the duplex to here. This one was a duplex before. That was a single, that was a single, and that was a single. So the rest of the buildings are in the same place? They're all in the same okay. place. Yeah, I mean, that's general location where they'll be built. The only one that has got the uh, as built. Where is this thing? This one here, they've already located it on the ground, and that's why it's got an odd shape to it. So I'd appreciate having a copy. I don't know if I get them from you or from town planner. The Open Space Commission is meeting this week, and it would be good for us just to take a look at it. Yeah, I, I emailed them to Karina. She can okay. send them on to you. That's fine. And then one other um, question I had, the in perpetuity or 90 years um, might be something we ask the uh, Mass Audubon, but in the meantime, you were saying asked town council. I was a little confused. You said you'd ask Aldo, but isn't that up to the planning board has to decide to speak to Aldo, not the uh, proponent? Normally what happens is you'll send something to Aldo and he'll call me to discuss it if we have any issues. So I'm just one, step. was that yeah. something the planning board was in agreement to ask Aldo to do that? And could that be when Aldo, if he writes a I don't know if it's an opinion or determines, could the Open Space Commission get a copy of that? Basically what I'd do is I'd ask him if he was in agreement with what I have now, which I have to make a couple of edits to because I have to either put in perpetuity or 90 years. Uh, I would have him send a letter saying this form was appropriate back to you guys, or back to them. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? So. We have a plan to go forward. Yep. <clears throat> and then depending on uh, how this moves forward, we'll have you come back on another agenda, Bill. Can you put me on for the next agenda? Because I don't uh, know what Eldo's schedule is. 
Have you I'll talked to him, him recently? I'll find him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to Starbucks tomorrow morning. He'll be there. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've talked to him recently. Um, oh. So. I hope there's nothing wrong. No. Oh, okay. No, it's just that. Uh, I know he's busy. Not sure what his, his uh, availability is between now and the 17th. But uh, we'll, we'll, I can always we'll try to put it on the 17th. If, if, it, if things are ready, town planner will know that 48 hours ahead of time, and we'll either put it on the agenda or we'll bump it, okay. bump it ahead. Very right. good. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the uh, planner's report and the approval of minutes. I'll make it quick. I'll make it quick. Okay, just um, very quickly going through a few items. Um, 10A Fitzgerald Lane, the affordable unit for resale, um, was recently marketed on a first come first serve basis to open house on June 11th through uh, MCO Realty. Uh, I don't know the status beyond that, if they have selected someone or not, but first come first serve is whoever is eligible and puts in their paperwork and it's all complete is the person that gets selected. And I think it went out to like 7,000 different people on their list. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, recent CONCOM permits issued, um, 12 Barn Lane stormwater management permit, 230 Parkerville Road, order conditions for septic, 24689 Choate Lane, certificate of compliance, 175 Parkerville Road, emergency certificate to remediate underground fuel spill, uh, Park Central, denial of order conditions. Fayville Memorial Park, negative determination of applicability for park reconstruction. And 79 Deerfoot Road and 325 Turnpike emergency certificate to solve beaver-related flooding issues. Just so you have heard those ones. Um, on the budget update that we discussed last week, um, we have a contract pending with Mass Autobahn for open space inspections. Um, um, Don and I are just going to give it a review, hopefully tomorrow, um, and we'll get it executed um, for a total of $9,950, which will be a pilot program to start doing open space parcel inspections, um, setting a baseline inspection form so that maybe over in the future um, you'd have a catalog of all the open space parcels that are viably inspectable and enforceable and someone or a consultant or staff would go out maybe every two years and document if there's any encroachments or any changes or anything to be noted just so we can start getting record of those um, and that's kind of an add-on to the deed research project kind of a next step um, we recently had an inquiry from the Fay School um, for the turf soccer fields. Uh, they were looking to extend their permits, but they had expired and they had already been extended once. Um, so we haven't heard back yet once I let them know that they potentially would have to refile um, new applications. Um, the Board of Selectmen, the administrators, I had um, published a public participation at pub with meetings memo, and I, Elizabeth, do we have that posted on the website? It's a memo that went out about issues during meetings and if people get out of control, how to handle it and all that. It was a, yeah, it's probably on their website, but um, I have a copy at the office, um, and, and I think we may have emailed it to everybody too, but I can always send it again. Um, the MWRC, Metro West Regional Collaborative, has a full board meeting um, hosted by Southboro here on July 13th. That's a Thursday from 8 to 10. Um, they asked us, or we volunteered to host one of their board meetings here as a show of goodwill as being part of that collaborative. Um, 
I think at the last meeting there was a list of town appointments that of of um, appointments that were expiring. I don't think any of them had any. Um, yeah, but I think uh, like the, it was the historic, the adaptive use of, of historic buildings that was expiring. I was the um, South Borough Rep on the Metro West Regional Collaborative oh. last year, so that I guess is only a year appointment. So I don't know if the board wants to reappoint me or wants to, somebody else wants to do it. Was that on that list that we had? Let me see if I kept it in here. I think I did. Here it is. So this is um, <coughs> adaptive reuse of historic buildings bylaws subcommittee. And do we do all of these appointments? No, we just appoint no, one person. I think person. that's expiring, so we don't have to. That oh, oh, oh the that subcommittee is is going to uh, has served its purpose. Going to go away. Okay, so the only appointment we have then is the Public Works Planning Board, and the only name we have is James Helen. And I believe. Um, it's appropriate that we take action on that tonight. That's uh, our only choice, is what you're saying? When you say the only name. That's I all we have here, yeah. I just have a point of order on that. I mean, we've had over the last couple of years some feedback from the public when we make appointments without it being an agenda item on a posted agenda in advance. I think of the my own opinion, we're best served to follow that procedure. So we'd have to put this, this on the July 17th? I would recommend it. Agree? To make it, to give mm -hmm. the public, if somebody else wants to put their name forward for the, the post. Okay. What else do we have? We also, at some point, need to discuss um, Stonebrook Village had submitted an application to modify major site plan and definitive subdivision uh, with an application fee, and the day before the public hearing, they withdrew the application. So there was um, $1,170 of application fee, and um, I think it would be wise to discuss at some point if that gets returned or if we maintain or if we keep that amount to cover the cost some of the costs that Elizabeth and I incurred you know sending the notices out and etc they were going to change the name of the road to Gaffney way so just a this is just a uh, kind of a this is something we need to think about whether we what we do with that application? I don't know that. I don't know the precedence. Do you usually return those application fees, or if somebody withdraws an application? Uh, no, we don't. But uh, my memory is that uh, if there's little or no action, um, other than the materials being submitted to the planning department, then the, the fee would be returned. But in this case. Um, it would seem to me that if, uh, you know, town resources uh, were used up to the point of it when it was withdrawn, then we should quantify those and, um, and then uh, return the remainder, if any. Totally in agreement with that. Agreed. So we'll ask you to quantify uh, to the best you can, the uh, hours and the, the uh, costs to the town for that application, uh, the whole application process, not just re receiving it, but also dealing with the withdrawal. Is that something that uh, you, you have to agree on to how much goes back, or is that something you and I work out in the office when I give you the information? No, I think the board and the public should be aware that um, of what what transpired, how much effort was put into it, what the town costs were, and then the board would uh, have the opportunity to uh, 
know that and agree to it and then probably take a vote to um, not return anything, to send an additional bill, or to return it all or some of it. Okay. And that would be based. That would be uh, based on on your uh, submitting to the board your estimate of the cost to the town. Okay. I'll forward that information. I do have a rough estimate, but it'll give you a chance to mm -hmm. look at what we had. Okay. And. Um, quickly, recently uh, we had an inter uh, a resident who came in at 5961 Central Street, also 8183 Turnpike Road. It's contiguous lots, asking about potentially developing that into six to eight duplexes, 16 units, if you're familiar with that area. Um, it's uh, near Route 9, it's 59 and 61 Central Street. It'd be his first project, but he was asking questions, so that may be up and coming. Do we have the ability to build duplexes other than over 55? I think we Within do. Within zoning? Um, I don't know. I, I'd have to look back at what that zoning, what, what district he's in, and then see if it's he can have multifamilies. I can't. I'll have to check that. I think it is, but I'm not sure. I just wanted to give a quick up, like somebody's interested in doing that, just as a precursor, what might be coming down. Um, the Canes Crossing appeal period ended today at 5 p.m. Um, the applicant has um, provided a check for the remaining uh, review fees for Fuss and O'Neill, which we asked him for. Uh, so we'll be setting up a pre-construction meeting um, to be scheduled prior to construction at some point when he lets us know. And then this Wednesday, Ken's, um, Ken's, in, uh, Ken's Foods Inc. is having a pre-construction meeting with the Conservation Commission, which I'll be attending with the conservation agent, just to make sure they're aware of the condition, just to bring attention to the conditions of our decisions, our permits again. Uh, they are still in the appeal period, though. And that's it. Uh, Karina, there was an item, uh, I think you may have skipped it, Park Central Affordable Units. Oh, yes. Um, I contacted the DHCD, um, Margot LeClaire, and emailed back and forth to make sure that I got it in written form. The affordable housing units credited for that project will come off the subsidized housing inventory on August 24th, 2017, unless building permits are issued. And we, I went back and forth with Margo just to make sure what they were saying about appeal periods. And she said that um, the appeals have to be resolved. If building permits aren't obtained, then the appeals have to be resolved. And once the appeals are resolved, and if they're in the right direction of approval for the, it, the project to continue, then that's the date that they go back on this subsidized housing inventory. So in the interim between August 24th and the issuance of the building permits, another project theoretically could be applied for under Chapter 40B. Yes. So would that somehow... If, if mass housing were to, were to approve that, would that somehow affect the 40B status of Park Central? I would think, and I can repose this additional question, I would think that if the number of affordable units that are proposed and passed put you over the threshold, I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. That's a new I would, angle I would, I on think that. that. I think that it would be prudent to explore that with the HCD because... I think I have the answer to that in my office in, that I wrote down when I talked to her. I didn't expect you to ask that tonight, but I have it ready because I did follow up with them. So what I'll do is I will um, review my notes and I'll follow up with you on that. Um, 
because I did talk specifically to DHCD because I know that's where you were going. What is what yeah, happened? I mean, this is again. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a if it's, it's a difficult situation because yeah. the, the project is you know sort of in in limbo, so to speak, mm-hmm. and. The whole point of the project is to fulfill that 40B threshold and get us into safe harbor. Right. And the fact that it's going to come off of the DHCD inventory in August, which is right around the corner, is concerning. Right. From the perspective of the, you know, that was the whole basis of the project under the 40B statute in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, but you, the, the, I think we would, I think it would behoove us as a department to get real clarity on exactly if if it if on August 24th here is what could happen yes to this and I town. think I have that I just can't recall because okay. I didn't bring my folder in here yep. and I, <laughs> I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to ambush you with the question no, you're, but you're it not. is <clears throat> since it's on the this you know it's on the agenda now is a good time for me to raise this concern the wording of the guideline is kind of confusing when you read when what dates mean what so when I spoke and emailed them Margo looked like she answered me and we re- went back and forth I even called her like three times I said I'm sorry you just need to explain this again make sure I'm understanding and those notes I have and, and they may answer that question because I was prepared to answer it but I just can't remember okay. without my handwritten note <laughs> so thank you you're welcome Anything else? We have minutes, June 5th and June 19th. Mr. Chairman, I, yep, I make the motion that uh, the, the planning board approve the uh, meeting minutes for the June 5th, 2017 meeting. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? And that's, these have been amended with my changes on it? Or, sh- or should we discuss my changes? Are, those, are they in people's packets? No. Oh, okay. So maybe we should discuss my changes. Sure. Um, the first thing I removed my name from um, as a member of the Open Space Preservation Commission, line 10. Um, on line 37, um, I clarified the project that uh, Mass Audubon was presenting wasn't the deed research project. It was the project that um, that the planning board initiated and it was um, a follow-up on the deed research to um, to offer suggestions on how to increase the level of protection on the open parcels that were deemed less than adequately protected per the deed research project. Um, And then on line 94 on the Pine Hill open space, um, I just clarified that um, town meeting had uh, initially denied the acceptance for the road. It wasn't the planning board. Um, And that it was the stakeholders had met and it was agreed that a conservation restriction would be placed on the open space. And that's it. Uh, motion as amended. As amended. Any more discussion? All in favor? Four to zero. Thank you. June 19th. I haven't looked at June 19th. We'll do those next time. I 
I'm going to recuse from that vote when it occurs because I was absent. Okay, the next item on the agenda will require us to um, uh, enter into executive session. Um, the board uh, will entertain a motion that the board uh, go into executive session. The board uh, will be entering into executive session per Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21 to discuss strategy with respect to pending litigation. As the chair has determined that having the discussion in open session may be detrimental to the public body's negotiating position, exemption number three, and not to return to open session. So um, if this vote uh, carries, uh, we would ask that the room be cleared Guess that's not going to be a problem. Mr. Jenks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we go into executive Mike, session. sorry. Microphone, Phil. Mr. Jenks. Uh, wait a minute. i got to get it in front of me. I got it. Mr. Chairman, I move that we go into executive session under... Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21, to discuss strategy with respect to pending litigation. The chair has determined that having the discussion in open session may be detrimental to the planning board's negotiating position, that is exemption three, and we will not be returning to open session. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. It's roll call. Mrs. Luttrell. Aye. Aye. Mr. Stein. Aye, sorry. Mr. Jenks. Aye. Mr. Morris. Aye. We're in executive session. Thank you.